testing the microphone. Testing. Two cups. As Mac Miller once said, don't ask this man what's in his cup. Rest in peace, Mac Miller. What up, everybody? Spontaneous burst of motivation to do this. You gotta ride it when it comes. My name is Caden Howlett. If we've never met, welcome to the YouTube channel. I am a field geologist. I am pursuing a PhD at the University of Arizona. And before I start this video, I just want to share a few thoughts. This is basically a video in which I intend to share a few thoughts. I feel like there's all we're always kind of like riding a fine line with how much we want to promote our own creations or our own contributions to science. And that's a really interesting thing that I'm coming to learn more about. As you may know, I usually don't hesitate to put a bunch of stuff online, for better or worse. Um, that being said, I, I guess what I'm trying to do is justify these kinds of videos and emphasize why I think they're important because the purpose of this video is to share a few things that I learned during the creation of the first chapter of my PhD dissertation. This happens to take the form of a peer-reviewed journal article and like, you know, as you become older and wiser and you surround yourself with really smart people, you learn that people have different approaches to this. Like for me to sit down and be like, and I've done it before, you may know, I have a different video on this. I've sat down and been like, here's something that I created and I am sharing it with you online. And it's easy to kind of get in your own head with that. But all of this is to say that for me personally, the pros definitely outweigh the cons. And I think that sharing what I'm doing, even if this, like, it's not totally correct or, um, you know, I'm self-conscious about it a little bit. I think that um, doing this is helping some people, including myself. So I'm going to keep doing it. And you can judge me if you want, um, and that's fine. But that's a little preamble. <laughs> Thank you for bearing with me. Mm. I guess that the purpose of that preamble is that if you are a graduate student and you're feeling intimidated um, by self-promotion or sharing these creations that you make, maybe don't think about it so much because you should be proud of what you're doing. I know that some of the stuff in here isn't exactly right, but I'm still proud of it. I created something and you know, it's gonna go behind a paywall. So why not share something with the, the broader community? I could go on all day about it, but hopefully you understand what I'm getting at. So I just wanna share a few things that I've learned. This is the first chapter of my PhD dissertation. It is a journal article in the Geological Society of America Bulletin. The title is Late Cretaceous Exhumation of the Little Belt Mountains and Regional Development of the Helena Salient, West Central Montana. So that's a lot of words, and this is very technical geologic literature. This is a 25 page kind of behemoth of a paper for me um, that I learned a lot writing. I learned a lot about a lot of different things, including how to approach scientific questions. And I don't really want to like take a ton of time here, but I'm going to share some of the things that I um, uncovered and discovered, not only scientifically, but about myself. And so that's the title of the paper. This project started in the summer of 2020. I went out and met the University of Arizona Tectonics Research Group. This was my introduction to them. We were lucky enough to do field work during that first summer of the pandemic. I spent another field season out there in the summer of 2021 doing things like geologic mapping, sample collection, and all the other good stuff that we do. And three years and four months later, I have a printed and typeset journal article. It's immensely rewarding um, and it's extremely difficult and time consuming. It's always going to be hard. I don't know. It's going to be hard for me forever I, because I've done this before and it's not getting any easier. Maybe a few things are getting easier, but the science itself stays very difficult. 
So that being said, did some field seasons, um, and the kind of the, what we wanted to do with this was there was this amazing mountain range in central Montana called the Little Belt Mountains, and people had used a technique known as low temperature thermochronology in all sorts of analogous structures in the western U.S. These are structures that are cored by Precambrian basement rocks. We refer to the general area as the Laramide Province, um, and we refer to these individual mountain ranges as Laramide uplifts. And so there was this awesome opportunity, as I get completely scorched by the sun, uh, there was this awesome opportunity to go produce the first low temperature thermochronology data from this uplift. And why this technique is powerful is because it tells us uh, about the timing of rock uplift and exhumation. And we usually use these, these dates or ages that we produce as a proxy for thrust or reverse faulting. That is to say, um, we can determine the timing that the upper crust is being contracted or undergoing compressional stress um, and deforming and creating mountain ranges. That's what we're interested in, the timing of mountain formation. And so I collected all these samples. I can put up a few images here, like as we go through the paper, you're not gonna be able to see it on the paper here, but I love creating maps, geology. If you're interested in geology or geography or anything, earth system sciences, Learning GIS is invaluable and creating maps is so fun. So lean into that if you like it, if you're an undergrad. I created some maps, learned a lot about the structure, um, and I'm just gonna go right into one of my, my main takeaways or definitely my favorite part of this project was I had done literature reviews. I've, I've, I've published papers before, but I really, really immersed myself. I was in the depths of the scientific literature. I was pulling out, you know, people's master's theses from Princeton in the early 50s, getting like interlibrary loans. That is to say that through this process of writing this paper, I learned just about as much as a human could about this area of the world. For me, there's people that still know more than me, of course. Um, but for me, that was super, super valuable, and I enjoyed it immensely. Some context, I guess, is that the reason I dove into the literature is because I wanted to figure out how these new data fit into discoveries that other scientists have made. And people have been working in here since the late 19th century. Charles Doolittle Walcott, um, Walter Weed, Weed and Pearson, 1900, early USGS geologists. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm framing these new discoveries in the context of their science. So that was a huge takeaway. I hope that if you're a sci pursuing science, that you can find a project that, that lends itself to you leaning into a real literature review because that can start to feel amazing. But yeah, so I created some maps. I got really familiar with the regional geology. I dove deeply into this thing known as the Belt Supergroup. I'll spare you the details, and perhaps the details aren't totally understood even by the best of them. But the Belt Supergroup, this is a 1.5, let's say, billion-year-old stack of sedimentary rocks. It's immensely thick, and I had to learn a lot about it because it's very relevant to the study area. So, you know... As we go through the paper here, built, some, built a little cross-section, uh, did some geologic mapping, fi uh, fixed a few things that I think are, were incorrect on previous maps, um, and then I'll, I'll throw up this figure three which shows the location of samples um, in the field area. Beautiful little belt mountains. Then I did a bunch of thermochronology. This technique is badass. It takes a long time to learn. It takes a long time to prepare and analyze your samples. You have to be patient and you have to be efficient, really, to get it done. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, I got these, I've talked about accessory minerals a lot on this platform, um, but I got these little tiny minerals out, apatite and zircon. On apatite, I did what's known as fission track thermochronology. I explained it in a different video. I won't get into the details here, but just to recall, these techniques are used to determine the time at which this mountain range, the Little Belt Mountains, were being uplifted and exhumed. 
from depth. That's cool. One of these figures utilizes a modeling software called Hefty. Shout out to Rich Ketchum at UT Austin for developing this software. It enables us to create basically thermal history models, two-dimensional time temperature paths. So you can think of this as the cooling history of a rock as it goes from a certain depth in the crust corresponding to a certain temperature to the surface, which is where we're sampling these rocks, right? So that's cool. I got a little into the weeds of some thermochronology stuff. Another technique I used, zircon, uranium, thorium, helium, thermochronology. These, these chronometers are sensitive to different temperatures in the Earth's crust. And so we like to pair multiple thermochronometers on the same rock sample can be really helpful. Perhaps I'll describe that in another video. There's some two-dimensional geologic cross-sections in here. Kind of fun. Down into the what we know what's known as the Helena embayment, getting back into the belt supergroup. I'll spare you the details. There's some field photos in here, some field observations, you know, the meat of geology, boots on the ground, field geology, holding rocks, touching rocks, measuring their orientations and various structures from the micro to the mega, or I guess let's say macro scale, the outcrop scale. So that's cool. The figure I'm probably most proud of, I'll throw up on the screen. This is a synthesis, a regional synthesis of various constraints that were um, compiled from the literature. Constraints on things like magmatism, the emplacement of granitic plutons, for example, folding, faulting, volcanism, surficial, magmatism, eruptions, basically. Um, and yeah, all of this stuff can be used, uh, like I said earlier, a little bit. Um, it can be really helpful to approach things regionally um, to understand your data set in a given spot. And shout out to Pete Desell, especially here, uh, who's one of my advisors and a, a geologist at the University of Arizona. At least our group, and, and you know, a lot of people think about it this way, mountain, a mountain range, right? We refer to these things, at least in this context, they're called Cordilleran orogenic systems. Same with the Andes. They're interconnected entities. Um, when something happens distally, maybe let's say like at a subduction zone all the way out, maybe 600, 800, 1,000 kilometers from this mountain range, it's affecting that it's a it's a it's something and i say this because the regional approach when you're doing regional tectonics um to, to back way up and be like okay how does my data fit into a regional framework can give you really profound insights into the behavior of the earth's crust and these are the questions we're interested in how does the earth's crust deform what kind of structures are responsible for the uplift and exhumation of rocks stuff like that so that was a really fun compilation that I did. And then I dove into something more technical known as Coulomb wedge theory, critical taper theory. The basic idea is that um, picture a flat lying pile of sand, or let's use the snow example. If you're shoveling snow off of your driveway, you might have noticed if you pay close attention as you're pushing it with a backstop in a certain direction, you might start to have little let's call them faults, breaking out at the front. The idea here is that, at least in critical taper theory, or the wedge theory, is that you'll reach a critical angle of that snow at the front of your shovel where it's no longer stable and, and the wedge, in this case, will propagate outwards and you'll keep piling up snow in that direction. I'm pretty convinced, and you know, a lot of smart people have convinced me that this is a realistic way to think about um, thin-skinned fold and thrust belts. That's a lot of words, but if you haven't looked into it, look up some sandbox models on YouTube. Geo, the geo models on YouTube is great. Um, but yeah, dove into that a little bit. Um, and I think that I'm hoping that this contribution makes at least 10 people think, um, you know, not a lot of people work this closely on this kind of stuff, but um, over time and small, small contributions,
can really can really add up and teach us a lot about the behavior of the earth so that's a lot of words and i talked a long time and i'm getting sunburned but i hope you enjoyed that it was just a beautiful experience and i'm proud of this publication it's done it's out there in the world and i was joking with my mom because you know people are lying if they say that these things don't cause them stress takes a long time and you run into a lot of issues but you know you, you're like i just can't wait for this paper to be done like i'm gonna get this out there and it's fine and then i the the day that this was accepted or even in the transitional period i was like all right on to the next one start the new journal you know diary type thing and it's like all right where do i start with this new like mercedario paper this andy's paper um and that's one thing you'll learn if you're if an up and come if you're an up and coming scientist uh you'll learn the to kind of just chill out a little bit and be like this is going to keep happening and i'm going to keep a level head and approach these questions as patiently as i can <laughs> um but yeah it was a great learning experience i really have to shout out gilby jepson He's a really close friend of mine who is a professor now in Oklahoma um, at the University of Oklahoma. And then my advisors, Barbara Carapa, Peter DeSell, and then a friend and colleague, Kurt Constenius, who helped a lot with some Montana stuff in the context of this project. You know, hopefully that was entertaining um, or informative, maybe a little philosophical. The sun is setting, feeling very relaxed right now. But yeah, thanks for listening. I hope everyone's doing well out there. Keep learning, keep grinding, confronting difficult questions. If I can do this, you really can do anything because this is real science. And I, you know, let's put it this way. I maybe don't have, I'm not genetically predisposed to being great at this kind of stuff, but I'm doing it anyways. And it's rewarding. Not always fun, but I think it's important. And I hope you guys are finding stuff like that out there. And thanks for listening to me talk. Drop a comment. Let me know what you've been doing. Peace out, everybody. Always appreciate your support.